Thank you for joining the Savvy Ladies Wednesday Wisdom Webinar. I'm Maggie Montemuro, and I'm the Marketing Manager at Savvy Ladies. I would like to remind you that if you have any questions during the webinar, you can type them into the chat box. If you're joining us by phone, email your question to info at SavvyLadies.org. Today's presenter is Diane Duresta, founder and CEO of Duresta Communications, Inc a New York City consultancy serving business leaders who deliver high stakes presentations. Diane is a certified speaking professional who has the unique ability to get to the core of the message and translate complexity into simplicity. Diane is also the best selling author of Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch and Pizzazz, and the ebook Give Fear the Finger. Thank you for being with us today, Diane, and let's get started. Thank you, Maggie, and I'm excited to be here. It's my first time with Savvy Ladies, so I wanted to, again, thank you for having me, and this is how to give a knockout presentation. You addressed a lot of what I have on this slide. I wanted to introduce myself very briefly to say that I am a past president of the New York chapter of National Speakers Association. My sweet spot is women leaders and senior executives in corporations, although I do work with entrepreneurs as well. And the three areas of concentration to making you more successful are the public speaking presentation area, interpersonal communication, and media training. On a personal note, I'm a native New Yorker. I am married and I live with my husband and my cat, Pinky, who you'll see in that picture. So. What are we going to do in the short time that we're here? I want to talk about the importance and the power of your presentation. I'm also going to share common mistakes I've learned through my 20 years in a living laboratory. And finally, what it takes to be confident. So I'd like you to be able to walk away with tips to make you more confident in all of your presentations. I thought it would be fun to start with a brain teaser. So here it is. How is public speaking like a yam? Now, when I ask this in groups and seminars, the answer I usually get is because I don't like it, <laughs> but that's not the reason. This is actually a formula for everything you need to know about public speaking. Know yourself, know your audience, know your message, Y-A-M, and it really is that simple. So it starts first with you. As a package of skills, what are your strengths and how can you leverage that and where do you need to do some fine tuning? Knowing your audience, this is the weakest part I find with people. You want to tailor your audience or your message so that you profile your, your audience and you know exactly what their hot buttons are, what they care about, and their style. How do they like to receive information? And then finally, what is your message? And know it cold. And it's a good idea to have at least three main message points that you want to get across so that people are clear about your message. But it's about having a laser-like focus and outcome. I've been saying for a quite a while that speaking is a new competitive advantage, and that's because everything has become so commoditized that it's just a matter of time before someone has the same product or service that you do. And there are a number of benefits. The first thing is when you're out there speaking, you're building your brand reputation, and I can't think of a better way to do that than through speaking because people see you in action. You also gain visibility. So whether you're internal or external, volunteer to speak. For, especially for women, this is a groundbreaking or game changer because it levels the playing field. You need to get out there and be seen. And then finally, it in, it's an opportunity to increase funding, meaning if you are looking for money to fund a business, you have to have a good presentation. If you're asking for a raise, if you are looking for to be paid to speak, all of these things require really good presentation skills. So it's a true advantage when you have it. And if you are an entrepreneur or business owner and you're not using speaking as a, as a, uh, as a marketing tool, you're leaving money on the table. So let's talk about communication because when you meet up with somebody else, your brains form an instant connection. 
there's actually something that can be measured that happens between two brains. And it takes exactly 0.07 seconds, according to neuroscience research, for that connection to happen. So you want to make sure that it's a positive connection. Success when you're communicating has to do with these three areas, and especially when we talk about executive presence and gravitas. It's about how you look, how you communicate, and how you act. And I'm going to spend time on number two today, how you communicate. <clears throat> There was an interesting study at UCLA by a professor, Albert Morabian, excuse me, and he studied likability in one-to-one -one social interaction. And he realized that when you're face-to-face, -face, you're communicating with your body language, your tone of voice, and your words. And he wondered what was most impactful. So I'm going to ask you that question. Which will people believe first, the body language, the tone, or the voice? or the words. Would you use your chat box? And I'm curious, which do you think is the most impactful? What will people believe first? Is it the body? Is it the voice? Or is it the words? So there's a chat box at the bottom. I see body language, tone, okay? Body, body, body language. And the bodies have it. Yes, that's the correct answer. And that's because it's visual. We believe the first thing that we see. And you're Emotions which are unconscious are first conveyed through the body. The body doesn't lie. But here's what's even more exciting. He quantified these three levels. So when it came to likability, and he looked at people one-on-one, -on -one, with communication being 100%, what percent do you think was visual? And then what percent was tone of voice? And what percent was words? I'm going to give you the answers. In this one study, the visual was 55% of the message, the vocal was 38%, and the words were only 7% when it came to communicating likability. So what does that tell you? People will believe what they see over what they hear. And that's why when I coach people or I train them or speak to them, I always start at the visual first. So what can get in the way? What are the visual detractors? Well, the first thing is the handshake. And the question is, are you a bone crusher? Because if you are a bone crusher, this is the impact that you have. You're hurting people. And it's often a sign of aggression. It's not a very powerful way to communicate. But even worse is the weak fish or the jellyfish handshake, where it's slimy and there's no firm pressure at all. So the first point of contact is your handshake. You want it web to web and you want there to be some pressure because that says I'm confident. Another thing to think about is how you hold yourself, your posture, your stance. Now this woman, although attractive, comes across as demure. She's not in a power position because she's in what we call a fig leaf position. So anytime your hands are below the waist, you look tentative. This is even worse. This guy is slouching. So when you come to the table and you're slouching or you're standing and you're slouching, it looks sloppy. So when your mother told you to stand up straight, she was teaching you to be a good presenter. You want both feet flat on the floor, shoulder width apart, you want to stand up to your full height, head fully on your neck, and your shoulders back. Weight evenly distributed. As women, we need to be careful of two things. The head tilt, which is not a power stance. You want the head to be straight. And you don't want to do excessive head nodding or bobbing. You want to nod when it's appropriate, but not excessively. And then what do you do with your hands? Well, you don't want to have nervous mannerisms. When you're fidgeting, you're signaling again that you're nervous. I've seen people twirl their hair, tap a pencil, play with a paper clip. The best thing you can do is get your hands above the waist and then gesture. But not perpetual motion, but gesturing when appropriate. So in U.S. culture, when you gesture, it's considered a good thing. It shows confidence. Another thing to consider is your attire. And your attire is a visual shorthand. It tells the listener a lot about you. And if these two people were working for MTV 
or were roadies working for a band, they would be perfect. But for most people who are working in companies or firms, it's not appropriate. So without going into too much detail, because it depends on culture, here are two tips to always remember. Number one, get to the place early and check yourself out in a mirror because you don't know. If you had a poppy seed bagel or spinach quiche, guess guess what's stuck between your teeth? The second thing is dress one notch higher than your audience. So if it's peer-to-peer, dress appropriately, but one notch higher. And be careful because if you're going on a factory floor and people are in jeans or overalls, you don't want to walk in with a three-piece suit. So this goes back again to know your audience. And when it comes to clothing, the most important factor is fit. It's not how expensive. It's does it fit your body. And sometimes you might invest in a good tailor. But it is a visual communication, so it's important. The most important visual detractor is the lack of eye contact. Now, you can see this man here is not connecting. He's looking up. He's searching for a thought. Most of us in a one-to-one situation are pretty effective. I like to use the 70-30 or 80-20 rule. Most of the time, you're looking directly at the person, not 100% because that's staring. But what do you do when it's a large audience? So here's a solution. What you do is you come into a room and you break it up into sections. So here are quadrants. If you're speaking to a boardroom, then you'd have thirds, the back and the sides. Right away, find a friendly face, talk just to that person. Then come over to this section and look at that person for a few seconds. Now the next person in the third section, again, a complete sentence or two. And then finally over here, there is nobody else but that one person and stay with the people who are smiling and nodding. So what you've achieved is an eye connection. You want your message to land, and you want a relationship. So you don't want fleeting contact. You want an eye connection. And when you do this, it helps your nerves because you're now talking to an individual instead of a group. What happens now when it's the voice, which is 38%? Well, one of the best-known vocal detractors are non-words. Like, you know, the best way to get rid of them is, one, create awareness, know that you're doing it, and number two, substitute a pause. It's not always easy, but it makes such an impact. One or two are okay, but if people are counting them, you're going to lose credibility. Also, when it comes to speaking volume, If I talk like this the whole time, you're going to think I'm lacking confidence. And it's hard to hear. So you want to make sure that you project your voice. And there are two kinds of voices that I talk about frequently. One is the conversational voice for smaller groups. And then there is the presentation voice that you hear at the back of the room. Now, I'm trying to project louder than normal because we tested the sound and it wasn't that great on my end. So I'm hoping that I'm coming across clearly. But the message is project if you want to be perceived as confident. When it comes to speaking rate, are you a tortoise or are you a hare? Yes, some people are slow talkers, but more often than not, they're jackrabbits going ahead like an Indy 500 race, and then we don't understand what they're saying. Here's what I've discovered. It's not that we say the words too fast. It's that we don't come to a complete stop. And that is the remedy. You need to stop at the end of a sentence. And here's the best way to do it. Use the beat technique. Three beats at the end of a sentence will give the listeners enough time to process and understand the message, and it will give you time to collect your thoughts and breathe. And the side benefit is you'll appear confident. So let me demonstrate. Today is Wednesday. Tomorrow will be Thursday. And then it will be Friday. It feels long, but the impact is not. It is really impactful to use strategic pauses. We all recognize this visual. You know when you hear that sound, somebody is brain dead. And when you speak in a monotone, your audience becomes brain dead. So if you know that you tend to be a little flat, 
there are a few things you can do. Number one, speak louder. As you increase volume, your pitch gets higher. Another thing to do is to use a yellow highlighter and in your notes, highlight key words so that you get emphasis on those key words. But the most important thing you can do is to get excited because when you're passionate, you will not be monotone. So tell more stories instead of facts. This is also related to intonation or tone, and it's called up talk. You're making a statement, but it sounds like you're asking a question. And I even hear it at networking events. It sounds like this. Good evening. My name is Diane DeResta. Well, is it or isn't it? If you don't know your name, I don't know if I want to do business with you. So here's the thing. It sounds tentative, and when someone uses up talk or up speak, it means they don't have conviction. So listen to the difference. Today is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. The first person sounds like a question. The second person is making a statement. When you want to be influential, bring your voice down at the end of a sentence. When you do prepare, it's good to write everything out. But then throw that script away and create message points so that you can talk from your knowledge base and so that you can sound conversational. Because if you sound scripted, if you sound like a talking head, you will lose credibility. Here's a secret. If you forget something, the audience doesn't know. So don't worry about missing a sentence or two. What are the key points and talk from your knowledge base? And of course, don't mumble. Mumbling is when you don't open your mouth and you speak in a minute. Open your mouth, articulate the endings of words because it's the consonants that give clarity, and then pause at the end and you'll be clear. The last phase are verbal detractors, and these are what I call wimpy words or weak speak. So if you go along with me, it's sort of like what we did the last time, and I hope that you kind of agree because this is only a suggestion. If you present yourself like that, guess what you have just communicated with your words? Not very much. So if you pepper your words with, or you pepper your conversation with wimpy words, you're not going to be able to influence. Instead, use more powerful words when you go along with us by joining our group. It's not hopefully, it is. I'm confident. Not it's only, definitely. Only and just are modifiers. Throw them out of your vocabulary because they minimize everything that comes after. And recommend is a stronger word than suggest. Recommend means I'm putting my conviction behind it. All of what we've talked about now are symptoms of nervousness, and we all get nervous. But here's what I've discovered. When you are truly nervous, you are being self-centered because it's all about me, myself, and I, and you're thinking in the future of all the things that can go wrong, and that's what you create more of. So I'm here to tell you that it's not about you. It's about them, the audience. So get over yourself. Get out of future thinking and come into the present. And the best way to get into present state of mind is through your breath. Breathe and come in here and be in the moment and meet the audience where they are. Instead of worrying about you, start asking yourself, how can I make the audience feel comfortable? And a good way to do that is get to the room early. Meet and greet people. Have a conversation. And you may even be able to reference them and that conversation when you get up to speak. The good news is by wearing the uniform of confidence, you can show your audience that you're confident even when inside you're not. We've already talked about some of the ways that you can look and sound confident. As you are getting ready to present and your goal is to influence, there are some things that you can do. In addition to wearing the uniform of confident delivery, you want to begin by giving them the big picture. Don't start with details. Give them an overview and start with the bottom line first. What that means is don't make them wait till the end to understand why you're there. Get to the point and use fewer words and shorter words. 
In advertising, ads are aimed at 6th to 8th grade language because they know simple, short cells. It's clearer. Be sure that you're presenting benefits because too many of us get caught up in the process of what we do and the features. People don't really care how we do it. They want to know what they're going to gain. So what is the dream? What is the point of pain? What is the wish? What do they value? Those are the things that you want to emphasize. And to be specific when you're making recommendations, there are, there's no power in generalities. So the more specific, the better. If I say coffee regular, that can mean different things in different parts of the country. If I say coffee with milk and sugar, that's specific and that is clear. And very importantly, when you're talking money, frame costs in a positive manner, meaning what's the cost of not doing it? I have a friend who's a sales trainer, and when she offered her services, the person said, well, what if I pay you to train them and then they leave the company? And she said, well, what if we, let, we don't train them and they stay? So what's the cost of not doing it? So here are some tips for takeaways that you can use after the call. When you walk into a room, have a confident entrance. Own the room. Establish rapport. Do that with small talk one-on-one -on -one or with opening remarks in a stand-up presentation. Quickly lead into an opening agenda because people need a roadmap. They need to know where you're taking them. Give them the big picture overview, but get to the point quickly and project your voice so that they think you're confident. When you're in a group, look at one person at a time and connect. Make an eye connection. Listen and listen actively. And one way to do that is by asking questions. Before you ever move on to the next area of your presentation, Seek agreement. Make sure people are on board and they're understanding and then move on. And so important, show enthusiasm. Get excited. It's your passion that sells. So talk from passion and end with a call to action. People remember the last thing they hear, so make it something that they're supposed to do and give them a time frame so that it's clear. So I'm going to give you a call to action, and these are things that you can do next after the webinar. First of all, practice regularly, and you can do it one-on-one. -on -one. You can do it on a phone. You can also hire a coach. And if you don't have the resources, you can ask for an accountability buddy to give you feedback. When you get off this call, immediately teach people anything that you learned because that will integrate the learning. You can also very inexpensively create a job aid. A job aid is a post-it. And let's say you want to pause. Write the word pause and put that post-it where you can see it. We all have smartphones. No excuse. Hold it up, videotape yourself, play back, and play it again. You'll see the way you're coming across and you'll be able to tweak it. And develop an action plan. What's one thing that you all are going to do when you get off this call today? Make a commitment. Here are some other next step resources I have for you. You can go to my website, duress.com, and you'll find a free monthly newsletter called The Science of Speaking. It's coming out tomorrow morning, so if you would like the February issue, I would sign up for that today. You'll also get an audio course called Seven Deadly Mistakes Speakers Make and How to Avoid Them for Maximum Success. There are a number of articles on the site. And if anyone is interested in coaching, you can send me an email and we can have an offline discussion. I have two books. One is called Knockout Presentations, which has been called the Bible of Public Speaking. The other is Give Fear the Finger, which is an e-book concentrating strictly on confidence building. There's also a blog on my website, as you can see from the URL. And I have 100 or more YouTube videos that you can take a look, just put forward slash Diane DeResta. And now, for those of you who are really serious about getting to the next level, I've created three one-hour webinars called How to Give a Knockout Presentation that will go in much more depth than we did today on this short webinar, that you can download them as MP3 or 4 files. I have the link right here, but you can go to DeResta.com, go to the Services tab, and to Webinar, and you'll see it. Webinar one is one hour, and it's all delivery skills. 
everything you need to know to look, sound, and speak the language of confidence. Webinar 2 is also an hour, and that's devoted to the structure and the organization. So you'll receive templates, structural step-by-step -step approaches on how to organize a talk, whether it's on the fly or if it's a formal presentation. And people have said that has been one of the most helpful things and resources they've had. And the third one-hour webinar is on Q&A control, managing the question and answer process, what to do when you don't know the answer, and how to handle difficult personalities and audiences. So you'll get strategies and tactics for identifying and handling people like the nitpicker, the hostile person, the whiner. So that's all there in a three-hour package. Now you'll see from this quote, the online webinar sessions had true impact in building structure in my presentations and gave me confidence in my role as a public speaker. That was from a training manager who did this for a living. So there's a lot of value there. And for those of you who do order it in the next 24 hours, you will get a free copy of my, my ebook, Give Fear the Finger. So lots of resources for everybody. I want to thank you for being on the call today on the webinar. I wish you success on the platform of life, and may every presentation be a knockout. And if there is time, we can now go to questions. I believe you can send the questions through the chat box. Yes. Thank you, Diane. If anyone has a question, you can type it into the chat or email info at SavvyLadies.org. And we had a question come in already, which is, I get nervous because I hate the tone of my own voice when I'm speaking. Is it possible to change the tone of my voice by practicing? The, uh, the answer to that, can you change the tone of your voice? We have certain fundamental frequencies, so you're not going to sound totally different. But you can do things to make your voice better. And one of the reasons we don't like the sound of our voice is because we hear ourselves through our bones and other people th hear us through airwaves. So we do hear ourselves differently. But yes, some of it is through breathing and phrasing. There are things that you can do to change the sound of your voice. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question here is, what happens if you forget what you want to say? What happens when you forget what you want to say? And I ha that has happened to me too. So there are a couple of strategies. One time I was talking to a group of prospective students. I was teaching at NYU, New York University, and I had brain freeze. I couldn't remember the word. So all I did is I said to the audience, what is the word I'm looking for? And they gave it to me. It was no big deal. Or what you can say is, I'm having a senior moment. Give me a moment. Or one person one time lost her place in her notes, and so what she did is she took out her glasses, very slowly put them on, and scanned as if she was trying to read. And by the time she did that, she found her place. But uh, it's about recovery strategies, and I have some of those in my book, Knockout Presentations. But the key is don't make a big deal out of it. It's okay to pause as well. It may seem like a long time. It usually isn't but it's how you handle it. If you don't get upset, the audience won't get upset. Just say it a different way. Or you can summarize what you just said, and then sometimes your thought will come back to you. Okay, thanks. Another question is, is Give Fear the Finger book only about public speaking or confidence in general? It's interesting that you say that because I wrote it as for confidence in speaking, but actually it can be applied to anything because it's fear. So I talk about the four categories or remedies from physical to mental to uh, biochemical to behavioral. So because fear is really about mindset, it could be applied to anything. Okay, thank you. Next question is, do you have any recommendations as to how to move with purpose when speaking, so not pacing? Yes. I call it walk, stop, talk. So what you want to do is work the room and have a purpose for your movement. Pacing back and forth is purposeless. So find 
three areas of the room, for instance. So now you're talking, and as you segue or transition, take a few steps and then plant yourself and talk a while to that section of the room. Now you have another section, so transition, walk a little bit, stop, and ground yourself and talk a while, and then do that again. So it's about moving, stopping, grounding, and talking for a while as opposed to back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Walk, stop, talk. Okay. And another question, follow-up to that is, do you have any resources about incorporating meaningful gestures when speaking? Yes, meaningful gestures. You want to use them when they're appropriate. So here is something that I use a lot. I use my fingers and I count off. So whenever you have an agenda or some points, First, I'd like to talk about, secondly, and then third. So bring your hands above the waist and count off on your fingers. That's one thing. You can also contrast and compare. So you can take your, right, your left hand and point it to one side of the room and then take your other hand and point it to the other side of the room. But what happens with gesturing is when you get involved in your message, your hands will happen naturally. But those are a couple of gestures that you can pre-plan in a sense. Okay. And another question here is, what would be your advice in terms of using these strategies if you're part of a panel discussion? If you're part of a panel discussion, you should have a good moderator and take your cue from that. So have a rehearsal with everyone in advance. Know what your role is and adhere to the time. One of the biggest mistakes is people go over their time. So stay in your lane, so to speak. If you're given five minutes, don't take six. Uh, try to be as communicative as possible. Instead, of, you don't want to read from a script. Have message points so you can glance down and see where you are, but talk directly to the audience and know how to transition. So sometimes it's very effective if you can pick up on what one of the panelists said. You can say, just as Diane was saying, one of the things I found is, and so you can incorporate what you hear. Okay. Another question is, do men have an advantage since they have deeper voices and are generally larger? Well, it depends on what advantage you're referring to, but when it comes to vocal quality, men have the advantage because they have a lower pitch in general. And the lower the pitch, the more authoritative. Think James Earl Jones. That's the ultimate in male voices. However, you don't have to have a low voice to have credibility, but you don't want to sound like Minnie Mouse when you're up here. So it's about lowering your pitch a tad when you need to be more authoritative or, or more serious or when you have a very uh, difficult senior audience you want to lower your pitch a little bit. But yes, men do have the advantage in that regard. As far as being bigger, it's really about how you move your body. But yes, if you think of presidents, most of the presidents we've had have been tall. I'm five foot two. I have to fight sometimes to be seen. And just recently, I noticed my photographs. I was getting crunched in between these two really big women. And so a friend of mine who does body work advised me. So now she said, always get on the end of a photo so that you're not crushed in the middle. And I make sure I put my hand on my hip and I stand up straight so that I'm not lost. So I, when you're small or petite, you have to work harder to, to be more present and to be more powerful. But here's the truth. You can be a pint of power. And I'm sure people would describe me that way when I'm on the platform. So yes, there's an advantage to height but you don't have to let that be a liability. Okay, great, good advice. Another question is, how do you know what to charge when you are just beginning public speaking? Should we do free speaking in order to gain exposure and practice? Absolutely speak as much as you can, wherever you can when you're starting out because you're, you're honing your message and your skills. And so there's a lot of free speaking that people do. I'm not being paid for this talk today. It depends on what your goal is. You, using it for marketing means you're in front of an audience that could be a referral source or could hire you directly. And so in that case, it may be worth it for you to speak for free. How, how 
do you charge in terms of starting out? It's a really hard question because it depends on the venue. Is it a nonprofit? Is it a corporation? The best way is to find out what their budget is. Ask the, the question, what is your budget? Ask other speakers who are out there with you. Or you can start with an honorarium and say, okay, I'd be happy to talk. I charge a $100 honorarium or I charge a 250 honorarium. I can't tell you what to charge because it's all over the map. It's more about what your message is and who is paying and what kind of resources they have and the value that they perceive. Okay, and do you have time for one last question? Yes. Okay, the question is, I feel that no matter how many times I practice or how much I prepare, I still get very nervous when I have to speak in front of a crowd because everyone is staring at me. What can I do to not freak myself out over this? All right, well, the first thing is people are not staring at you. That's what you think they're doing. You have told yourself they're staring. They are listening with rapt attention because they are so eager to hear what you have to say because you have so much value. They are there because you have something that they want, and that makes you a VIP. You're a very important person. So use the eye contact technique that I talked about. Find the friendly faces and actually bring friends to the audience if you can and let them be in the beginning. And having that smile and that nod will help you tremendously. The other thing to do is start with a question because that first one minute is the hardest for all of us. So start with a question, direct it, look at somebody, and get people talking because that right away creates a dialogue. It engages people. It gives you time to collect your thoughts and take a breath. And don't give so much power to the people. They are on your side. They're waiting for you to give them information that's going to be so helpful to them. So have a conversation. Don't give a speech. Okay. Well, we're about out of time. So I want to thank you again, Diane, for a really helpful presentation with so much great information. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And thank you for answering all of our questions, Diane. We hope that everyone thank you. will join us for future webinars. And thank you again so much for everything, Diane. Thank you. And please feel free to visit my website. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.